All right, welcome back. We've been discussing Gauss's Law. So last time we started Gauss's Law. Today we're going to continue Gauss's Law, and I'll show you an example of Gauss's Law. And then we'll look at what's the magnetic analog of Gauss's Law, and also get into Ampere's Law. Ampere's Law is another way to look at the current and magnetic field relationships. So we had uh, discussed last time Gauss's Law. Gauss's Law is this statement. It says electric flux through a closed surface equals 1 over epsilon naught times the sum of the charges that are enclosed. An electric flux, so that the little circle on the integral means a closed surface, okay? And electric flux means this. If I have some geometry of electric field going in a particular direction, electric flux says, okay, if I pick an area through which I'm going to calculate the electric flux, so then I, the, the flux that counts, okay, the part that gives you flux, is the part of the electric field that's perpendicular to that area, all right? So if you have a case where the flux lines are hitting smack on the area you're calculating, it's easy, all right? If you have a case where they're skewed away from each other, then what counts is the part that's the perpendicular component. So if I think of these electric field lines coming into this slanted area, I can break up the electric field into pieces that are parallel and perpendicular to this little area. Now, am I always going to have a flat area? No, I might have a really complicated area, but you know how calculus goes. You take your complicated area, you tile it with boxes, and in every little box you're going to say that it's flat there. And then later you'll take the calculus limit of very small boxes. So think for now of a very small box, and it's got a particular area to the box. I've got an electric field coming in, but I'm going to think of the box being tilted. So what do I do in that case? Well. It's like a net catching fish, all right? Only the fish that swim toward the net get caught. Fish that swim this direction don't get caught. So I think of the electric field coming in, and I'm going to break up the electric field into components that are parallel and perpendicular to this area. So there's a piece of this electric field that's perpendicular to the area. Those are like the fish that go through the net and get caught. There's a piece of this electric field that's parallel to the area. That component doesn't contribute to the flux. So only the components of the electric field that are perpendicular to this area. So you can either think of it, there's, there's two ways to think of that mathematically. The way it's written down up there is E dot N dA, where N is the normal to that area. So here's that area again, here's the electric field. And I imagine an, a normal to that plane, I'm going to take this electric field and dot it into the normal. That's the part that counts. Okay? So that's literally what that means. You can do it a different way though. Okay, which, and we discussed this last time. You can think about, well, what I really need is these guys to be smack heading into each other. So rather than breaking up the electric field lines into components perpendicular and parallel, I could take the area and project it back onto the perpendicular component. Does that make sense? I could take this tilted area and say, well, I just care about the part that's perpendicular to the electric field. And I could take that projection back. So either way you like to, to think about it is correct geometrically and physically. The way the math is written down is with the perspective of taking the electric field and dotting it into the normal. Do you have any questions about that? Okay, either way, it's the component of the net that's perpendicular to the flow of fish that catches fish. Nets that are laid sideways don't catch fish. Don't know if you've been fishing lately, but standard principle of fishing. Make sure the net is perpendicular to fish flow. All right, any questions about what the flux means? Okay, so that's Gauss's law. We were working it out last time for a point charge. So this is correct all the time for any shape and for any number of charges in there. And they don't even have to be point charges. They could be any shape of charges you like. Um, we were working it out specifically for the point charge case just to illustrate what goes on. So in the point charge case, so let me think of a point charge there in the middle. And the electric field that radiates out of a point charge is kind of like a dandelion or a starburst. And it has this shape and this, uh, this magnitude to it. 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q over R squared times R hat, where R hat's pointing away from the point charge. So in the case of the point charge, if we wanted to think of applying Gauss's law, we needed to find some net to put around it, okay? some area to enclose it by. And in this geometry, it makes sense to enclose it by a sphere. You can do any shape you like for Gauss's law, but Typically, in a, in a simple physical situation, you want to find what's called a Gaussian box. A Gaussian box that encloses your charge in the way that's going to make your life the easiest. So we enclose this guy with a sphere. And if I think about a sphere, 
surrounding a point charge and the sphere is centered on the point charge, then I've got this excellent geometric situation to where the electric field lines come straight out of the point charge and everywhere they poke this sphere, they're automatically perpendicular to the sphere. They poke up the top and they're automatically perpendicular to that sphere and so on. So that's a great geometry to be calculating in this case. So in that case then, I think about, well, what's the magnitude of the electric field on this sphere? The magnitude all over that sphere is constant because the sphere is a constant distance away from, uh, from the point charge. So the, the magnitude of that is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. And I pull that out of the integral, OK? Because as I integrate over the surface area, that magnitude's not changing. So I pull that out of the integral. And now the integral I'm left with is the surface area integral. And what's the surface area of a sphere? <coughs> 4 pi r squared. So that's what goes here. The 4 pi's cancel. The r squareds cancel. And I get q over epsilon naught. Okay? And we're thinking of this for a particular sphere, but it works for any size sphere. It would work for the small sphere, the, small, the smaller sphere, or the, the larger sphere. So the reason it works is because as the field falls off like 1 over r squared, the surface area grows like r squared, and they exactly cancel. And that got a star. Then we thought of expanding this to, um, to a general case. So rather than just surrounding this with a simple sphere, I'd like to be able to put it with any shape I like. We said, all right, think of breaking up the sphere into segments like orange wedges or something like that. And in any segment, the contribution so if you think all along this blue segment here, the contribution to this shell is the same as the flux through that shell, is the same through that part of the shell, and so forth. All right? Just in the same way, we made an analogy between flashlight shining on a piece of paper. So if I have a flashlight shining on a piece of paper, as long as I put the piece of paper where it's going to catch all the photons, it catches all the photons. right? So if the piece of paper is close to the flashlight, I get a small circle of light, but it's bright. If the piece of paper is far from the flashlight, I get a large circle of light, but it's dim catching the same number of photons. Same thing along here. It's got the same flux through any of those shells. And then I wanted to think of surrounding now this charge with any shape I like by following different spheres in different places. So we draw a line around this now, and I'll think of following the outer sphere, OK? And then drop back into an inner sphere and follow that sphere, and then drop back to another sphere and follow that one. And keeping in mind that if I'm on a per as long as I stay on one spherical shell, it's got that constant contribution of the electric field on that shell. And then when I drop back down to another spherical shell, I'm going to do it with an area. I'll take that slice of area and make sure that it's parallel to the electric field lines. And how much fish does a net like this catch? Nothing, right? So that little segment that drops down to another shell catches no flux. Okay? And then I get onto another shell, and then I drop down to another shell in a way that catches no flux. So then the flux through this shape is exactly the same as the flux through that sphere. Okay? So the flux through the outer surface is always the same no matter what. And now I can, in the standard calculus way of reasoning, I can make any complicated shape I like by thinking of tiling it into those little segments and then take the limit that those segments become finer and finer and finer until I recover the smooth shape and it all works out. So now this works for any smooth shape. I can take any shape I like for Gauss's law. You can make it a funny shaped bag. You can make it a box. You can make it a prism, a sphere, whatever you like. Do you have any questions about how that worked? OK. All right. Let's apply it to a completely different geometry. OK. So Gauss's law works in any geometry. OK. We just proved that it works in any geometry. Now, I want to think about what happens if I have um, a case where I'm not just using point charges. So it also works for any shape of charge you put in there as well. So let me show you how it works out for a plane. So let me have a, an infinite plane of charge okay, with a surface charge density sigma equals Q over A. So the way this goes is that sigma is the charge density, it's charge per unit area, and it's the same all over the plane. So if I think about this plane, and then I take any particular piece of the plane, and I take an area of it, take the area, and I could think of, well, what's the charge on that little piece of area? Take that charge divided by the area, that's sigma. Go anywhere else on the plane, take it any size, shape, area you like, count up the charge in that area, charge divided by area is the same. So that's sigma. And so given that, given infinite plane with uniform surface charge density Q per A, I want to find the electric field due to the plane. Have you seen this problem before? 
we did this before, right? So we did this in a different context, and we derived it um, from thinking about what the point charge contributions were like, and then we integrated it and found the total electric field. So you've already done this problem once, but now we're going to do it in the Gauss's law way uh, to illustrate Gauss's law. So I have, I have a, a plane. Due to the geometry of the plane, the electric field, so it's this infinite plane, the electric field has to simply point away from the plane. If it's positively charged, it points away. If it's negatively charged, it points towards. So I like to, th to think of the positive charge case first. So think of this positive plane. Electric field just points away. Anywhere you are, it just always points away from the plane. And I want to uh, use Gauss's law now to find the magnitude of the electric field. We know the electric field is going to have the same magnitude everywhere. Okay? We've calculated that before, but in fact, we can, we can also use Gauss's law to show that that's the case. So let's use Gauss's law. Now, the key to Gauss's law is to choose what's called your Gaussian box wisely. All right? The flux, you can calculate this flux, and it will work for any shape you choose. So given the geometry of your problem, choose a geometry for your box that makes your life easier. Okay, so you get to choose the box, make your life easier. In this case, I'm going to choose a cylinder that's oriented perpendicular to the plane. Okay, I could have chosen a box, I could have chosen a cube, you know, whatever. But the key is that I want to choose it in, in the same way, okay, in the same way to build up this shape, I thought of taking pieces of the area that were perpendicular to the electric field and other pieces of the area that were parallel, because the perpendicular ones are easy to calculate, and the parallel ones give me zero contribution. When, when coming up with your Gaussian box, use the same principle. Find something so that you get pieces of the area that are perpendicular to the electric field, and they're easy to calculate, and other pieces of the area that are parallel and give you no contribution. So here I did um, a cylinder. And so I have then this cylinder, and the face of it is the, is the perpendicular part, and that'll be easy to calculate because it's perpendicular. And then the part of the cylinder that's the smooth, curvy part is parallel to the electric field. Parallel nuts catch no fish, OK? So there's no flux through that part. That'll be easy to calculate. The only other thing I need to figure out, well, what does the Q inside mean? OK? It means the enclosed charge, the charge that's enclosed in my box. And in this geometry, the charge that's enclosed in my box is I just need to count up Based on the charge density, I just need to count up the area in there, and that'll give me the charge enclosed. I don't care about what's outside. That's the other beauty of Gauss's law. Who cares what's outside? Okay? It's just what's inside that matters. Do you have any questions about the setup? Okay? So always choose it in a way that works easiest for you. So here, the electric field is constant and perpendicular to the end area, which is A. So when I take the flux then through this box, on, on the right-hand side, Okay, I'm getting a contribution out here that's the electric field times the surface area. So I get E times A, but then I have the other one to worry about as well, right? I have to count up over the whole box. So there's this other face which also has end area A. So E times A over there plus E times A over there gives me E times 2A, or 2 times EA, however you want to think about it. And then the contribution from the parallel parts is zero. So this is the flux, the electric flux through that Gaussian box. E times 2 times A. Do you have any questions about how I got the flux? All right. So now I just need to think about, well, what's the charge inside? There's always this 1 over epsilon naught, and now I need the charge inside. So how do I get the charge inside? That's going to have units of charge. Okay. So how do I go from charge density, surface charge density, which is Q over A, to Q? I need to multiply by A. Okay. So Q over A times A, where this area A is the area, the cross-sectional area of that cylinder. So um, taking that together, I get sigma times A, and that's the charge inside. Does that make sense that that's sigma times A? Got that all right? OK. All right, now the A's are going to cancel. So cancel off the A's. And I can solve for the electric field. And then electric field is sigma over 2 epsilon naught, electric field of a, of a plane. Do you have any questions about how that worked? OK? All right. Now, we did it for a simple geometry. OK? It'll work for any geometry you choose, right? You could choose any shape box. I could choose, rather than choosing um, a plane, I could choose another charge configuration. I could choose, you know, 15 point charges, something like that. But the key is, if you have a simple geometry of charges, 
See if you can find a box that makes your life easy, where part of it's going to have a constant perpendicular contribution to the flux, and part of it will have zero contribution to the flux. So, so for example, um, if I go to a case, um, let's say that I have a line charge. I'm going to take this apart for now. Okay. Let's say that I have a line charge, all right, and let, let this be like an infinite line of charge. And the charge density on a line you would count as charge per unit length. Okay? So it's got different length, different units from up there, but a uniform charge density all on an infinite wire. Okay? What's the shape of the electric field coming off this guy? Think of a positive charge. Yeah, it's just spreading out. Okay? So it just comes straight off the wire in all directions. Straight off the wire in all directions. Kind of like a pipe cleaner. Think of a pipe cleaner, right? Um, so what shape box would you want to choose in this case? Cylinder, OK. And how do you want to orient the cylinder? <laughs> yeah, so like if this is my Coke can, which is a cylinder, I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to orient it this way and enclose it that way, OK? So think of enclosing this guy with a big you know, uh, soda pop can. And then I'll get contributions where now the end faces have how much flux on the end faces? Zero, right? Because the electric field's coming straight out, and it doesn't pierce through that part. So anywhere the electric field pierces the can, though, I get a contribution. And so now all along the, um, the curved part, I'll get a contribution. And it'll be constant if I choose that cylinder, if I center it on there correctly. So in, in simple geometries like that, you're going to be able to find um, simple Gaussian boxes that'll make your life easier. Any questions? Yeah? Well, OK, that, so that's a good question. I, so I could do it on the whole wire. All right, the physics equation is correct and will always work. So what will happen is if I take an infinite wire and then I make my Gaussian box infinite, it will be difficult to calculate. Because what will happen is that um, I'll get an infinite flux. And then I won't really know what the proportionality constant is anymore. Right? Once infinity happens, it's, it's hard to track. So it's better to take a finite box. Yeah, good question. It will work just probably won't, won't help you calculate the electric field. Yeah, good point. Other questions? OK. All right. So OK, so that was Gauss's law for charge. So this one related, this related the flux of the electric field okay, to the enclosed charge. Now, we could write down the same kind of integral for a magnetic field, right? This integral was just about taking electric field lines and seeing where they poked through and pierced the area that you're, that you're studying. Okay? We could think about magnetic flux as well. We could think about, well, what if I take an enclosed surface and I calculate what's the magnetic flux poking through that thing? So, so here's what uh, you would expect. All right? You would expect, OK, maybe you can generalize this. Okay? This is the case for charges. What if I tried to generalize it to the magnetic field case? I can write down the left-hand side for, for the um, magnetic field. The only question is, what kind of charge should I put inside, right? So it turns out that if I try to write down Gauss's law for magnetism, it's much simpler, right? I can think about the same kind of geometric consider considerations, that I'll take a flux of the magnetic field, and you do it in the exact same way you calculated flux of an electric field. You just look for the magnetic field lines, try to put your area perpendicular to it. If you can't, then you're going to have to take some projections all right, to get the perpendicular component. That's your flux. It turns out, though, that when I take a closed surface, so the little surface on the integral symbol, sorry, the circle on the integral symbol means closed surface. When I take a closed surface for magnetic field, I always get zero flux every time. No one's ever found a contradiction to this. So how can that be? So think of a magnet. Think of, a magnetic, think of the magnetic field coming out of a bar magnet. So a mar, bar magnet has a, plus, uh, a north pole and a south pole. The magnetic field lines come out of the north pole, and they wrap back around and come back into the south pole. right? So now surround that guy with, a, with essentially a Gaussian box. And what you'll find is that you'll find that the magnetic field lines are poking out on one side, but they loop back around and pierce back in the other side. So you always get this net zero contribution. It's very much like that situation of thinking of a water fountain where water's flowing in and water's flowing out. Okay? So you never catch anything with Gauss's law for magnetism. No fish, okay? zero fish always. The fish swim in, the fish swim out. So no magnetic monopoles is what that means. When I have a bar magnet, a bar magnet is what we call a magnetic dipole. It has a north pole and a south pole. 
Wouldn't it be kind of a cool universe, though, if I could break that apart and have hand you the North Pole and I keep the South Pole? Okay, if we could do that, that would be kind of fun. We'd call that a magnetic monopole. No one's found it yet, okay? People look, they're clearly not common because no one's found one. I have a friend, uh, Dr. Bob, my friend Dr. Bob, who his, uh, he did his PhD at, at Caltech in physics, and his dissertation was looking for a magnetic monopole. And you might think, why bother? No one's found one yet, okay? There are some interesting theoretical physics reasons to expect that there might be one somewhere in the universe, okay? So he went looking for the thing with really sophisticated techniques, and his PhD was taken a while because he didn't find one. And, and at some point, he decided, okay, now I really don't want to find one because, you know, if I find one now, it's going to take me forever to write up my dissertation. And so anyway, he, it's true. He never did find that magnetic monopole, but people keep looking. Maybe someday we'll find one, and then we'll update that equation to have a magnetic monopole contribution. Do you have any questions about that? Okay. All right. Now, next up, something called Ampere's law. Okay. Ampere, <clears throat> do you, know, you know what an amp is, right? Okay. Amps named after Ampere. When you see current expressed in amps, it's after this guy. So Ampere's law is going to involve some current, and it's going to involve uh, magnetic fields. Let me first remind you of the Biot-Savart law, and then we'll build up to what's called Ampere's law. Okay, so the Biot-Savart law was the following geometry, right? The Biot-Savart law was about what happens when I have a current carrying wire. So here's current, and what does the magnetic field look like around a current carrying wire? It's this geometry. Okay, so that if you have current running this direction, the magnetic field circles this way. And the analogy we made in class was if you want to remember which way this goes, think of, your, think of a clock and think of how you feel about your alarm clock in the morning and think of stabbing it. Okay? The direction of your knife is the direction of the current and the direction of the clock face is the direction of the magnetic field. Or you can use the right hand rule, orient your thumb along the current and the magnetic field curls around it. There's the equation. Okay? And what we found before was that uh, for a current carrying wire, we said that the magnetic field is mu naught over 4 pi times I L over R times the square root of R squared plus L over 2 squared, all of that in the theta hat direction. Theta hat just means because it's a geometry that lends itself to cylindrical coordinates, we'll work in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, where theta hat is this direction, and R is just the distance from the wire. Could be here, could be there, but it's always the, mo the shortest distance to the wire. And now I want to think about very close to the wire. So let's get really close to the wire. R is going to be small, much, much smaller than L. And you remember how these approximations go? When you're doing approximations where I'm going to think of R much, much smaller than L, I turn it into money and think about that. So I think about L being billions of dollars and R being pennies. And then I look for places where those terms are added together in the equations. If they're multiplied, I can't approximate, OK? Because a billion dollars times 0.0001 you would care if someone did that to your bank account, right? All right. But just think about things you wouldn't really care if someone did to your bank account. If you have a billion dollars and you know there's a pennies error by the bank, you don't really care. So think of billions of dollars plus pennies, all right? And you're Bill Gates, it's not worth your time to pick up the pennies. So you cross off the R and you're left with that that square root of R squared plus L over 2 squared is approximately equal to L over 2. So this gives you in the equation mu naught over 4 pi times I L over R. Remember I didn't get to approximate the R because it's multiplied, not added. can only approximate things that are added. And then I have times L over 2. And all together, that gave me mu naught over 4 pi times 2i over r theta hat. Okay, And this is close to the wire. So that's basically this geometry is what that's telling you. Theta hat gives you that direction. Now, watch the slide closely. Okay, This slide was about very close to the wire. r is small compared to l. Okay. The new thing on this slide is all the same slide. I just changed the words to be about a very long wire, right? R is much smaller than L is the same thing as making the wire very long. So for a very long wire, I get the same thing, that, it's, uh, that the magnetic field is mu naught over 4 pi times 2i over r in the theta hat direction. All that's from a review from lecture 13. So now think of this very long wire, OK? And I'm going to have the very long wire oriented so that current is coming out towards you. So current's coming out towards you, and the magnetic field lines go, all the magnetic field lines you see are circles. Okay, you see the cross section here as circles. 
So this is viewed from the end. The red dot means currents coming out of the board towards you. And the pattern of the magnetic field is cylindrical. And I want to take what's called a line integral. Okay, So I'd like to take a line integral of the magnetic field along one of these circles. So you've seen a line integral before. Where have you seen a line integral before? Electric field, right? You used a line integral before to tell you the potential difference between two points is minus the electric field dotted into dl. And the way you did that was that, you know, the way you took any line integral, so if you were thinking about potential difference, you would say, OK, take a step, that's a dl, dot it into the electric field where you are, take that contribution, put it in your pocket, and step again, multiply the distance you stepped times the parallel electric field, put that in your pocket, and keep going. That's a line integral. Here we're going to do the same thing for magnetic field. So I have this magnetic field line integral. The circle on the integral means make a closed loop. So come back to where you started. And it's nice that this, this line up front is, is uh, curved. So we can think of this as being like along a really big circle where there's some flagpole in the next building that has current running up, Okay, but a really tall flagpole. So again, to take the line integral, I'm going to think about b dot dl. So dl means take a step, dl, Okay, take that length, Multiply the length I just stepped by the parallel field component, put that in my pocket, step again, take that DL length times the parallel field component, put it in my pocket, and add it all the way up. And as I walk around this circle, you might imagine, OK, magnetic field's going in this direction. If I walk along that circle and take that line integral, scooping up magnetic field times the distance I walk at every step, I get a contribution. Okay? So let's add that up. I can take the equation here for magnetic field. That's going to be line integral of mu naught over 4 pi times 2i over r theta hat dotted into dl. Okay? Mu naught over 4 pi is constant. I can pull that out. 2 is constant. I can pull that out of the integral. Current. Should I pull the current out of the integral? Is current constant? Just depends how I set it up, right? So if I set up this situation to be steady state, constant current situation, then it's constant, and I'll pull it out of the integral, just like you were all saying. R, is R going to be constant? <coughs> OK, now it depends how I set it up, right? So if I set it up so that I'm going to take this line integral on a circle that's centered on the wire, then R is constant. Okay? And again, it's like Gauss's law. I get to choose where I take this line integral. So I'm going to choose it so that r is constant, and I pull r out. So I'm left with a line integral of theta dot dl. OK, how should we think of this line integral of theta dotted into dl? First of all, what are the units on that? What's the units on that integral? Units of newtons, coulombs, no. What's, what, what units do you expect here? There's at least a length, right? OK, because there's a DL sitting in this. There's a length. What do I think about for um, units on an angle? <laughs> OK, when we're, when we're writing these equations, the angles pop up in, in radians. And that's unitless. OK, so we don't, we don't count that as units. So this guy's going to be in units of length, all right? And basically, at this point, to take that line integral, I think of the same thing. I take a step, that's a dl. Okay, I take the distance I just walked, dot it into theta hat. Oh, which direction does theta hat point? Well, it turns out that theta hat is always tangent to the circle, just like dl is always tangent to the circle. Okay, so theta hat's tangent to the circle because it's cylindrical coordinates. dl is tangent to the circle because I set it up so that my line integral is a circle. Okay, so every step I take, you know, I take dl times what? Well, times the magnitude of theta hat that's parallel to me, theta hat's a unit vector, so I get a factor of 1 there. All right? So I can, I can think then about how dl itself is r d theta. You've seen this before. How do I know how far I walked? Well, I take the radius times the angle I subtended. The reason that works is because if I walk around the entire circle, I get 2 pi r back, right? So if I take integral theta hat dot dl all around the entire circle, I'm going to get back a 2 pi r. Right? Do you have any questions about how to get the 2 pi r? Just walk it around the circle and pick it up the length all the way around. So here then I have mu naught over 4 pi times 2i over r times 2 pi r. Okay? That's what this line integral of magnetic field around the circle ends up being. And um, 2 times 2 times pi cancels the 4 pi. The r's cancel, and I'm left with mu naught i. So there's Ampere's law. Line integral of the magnetic field around a closed loop 
equals mu naught i. Okay? And what we really mean for this is the enclosed current. So it's the current enclosed in your loop. Do you have any questions so far? OK. All right, so uh, to tell you a little bit more about what we mean by, it's, it, I should have labeled that I enclosed. It means the enclosed um, loop. So if I think of current, see, sometimes I show you visual aids all right, that show you just a segment of wire. But if I have current running through the wire in any real physical situation, if current runs through the wire, it's got to be connected somewhere. So there's always a connection somewhere in a real circuit that brings it back. So now when I think about, well, is the, um, is the circle I'm making going to enclose this or not, I'm going to look for a loop. Um, so let's say, uh, <laughs> yes, I'll unplug that. All right, so let's say that I take this loop, all right, and, and OK, so I have a loop. Pretend the loop stays a loop. I'm going to take the loop and, and put it here. It's pretty clear that it's enclosing the wire, right? But if I could take the same loop and pull it off the wire, not really, right? Because in a real physical situation, this wire cannot end. It's, got, it's current, right? The current has to make a complete circle so, or a complete circuit. So this loop, if it's stuck on the wire, it's stuck on the wire. And it's stuck on the wire the whole time. So it turns out I can deform the loop in the same way we did with Gauss's law. I can deform the shape. I can deform this loop. I can twist it back and forth. I can move it along the wire. And the enclosed current is always the same, right? No matter the geometry that I have here. All right, so I'll show you that math. OK, so this is to remind you, though, it's going to look very much like what we did for Gauss's law. So Gauss's law for the point charge, OK, um, here we go. I want to remind you of the previous uh, slides you saw, OK? So the left-hand side here is going to be what we did earlier in lecture for Gauss's law. The right-hand side is going to be extending this now to Ampere's law. Okay? So basically, we already saw that in the Gauss's law case for a point charge, it worked for any size sphere, okay, because the R canceled. Something similar is going to happen for the magnetic field of a wire. All right? So in the same way, if I think of Ampere's law for the long wire, there was this piece that had a cancellation in it. The R is canceled. All right? So remember how back in the Gauss's law case, the R's canceled when it came time to calculate the flux. And I thought about any sphere. So in the Gauss's law case, it was, a, it was a spherical area. Over here, it's a line integral, but there's something similar going on. So on each sphere, the contribution of the flux was the same. Because if I think about a small sphere close to the point charge, it's a high electric field, but a small area. High electric field, all right, controlled by 1 over r squared. Small surface area, controlled by 4 pi r squared. Or if I think of going to a large sphere, right, now it's a weaker electric field that fell off like 1 over r squared, but it's distributed over a larger surface area. So I catch the same number of fish, OK? So it works for, works for any size. Same thing here. I take this line integral around this circle. If I take a line integral around a big circle, the magnetic field is small. The magnetic field is small by, by 1 over r, the distance from it, from the, uh, the wire. But I'll walk around a larger circle so I get the same amount as if I'd walked around a small circle, which had high magnetic field but a small circumference. So the r's cancel. I always get uh, the same contribution because the circumference goes like r, but the field falls off like 1 over r. Okay, all right, that gets a star. The stars I mean it's an important slide. Okay, now I can also think in the same way we did for Gauss's law, we thought about segments, right? In the Gauss's law case, we thought about the electric field coming out here in this wedge as like light shining out of a flashlight. Okay, and the flux through here was the same as the flux through here is the same as the flux through there. Similarly, in any segment, of the, these circles, OK, so take this wedge shape here. All along this segment, the contribution in any circle is the same. So the contribution to the line integral here is the same as the line integral I would get for out there, as long as I'm subtending the same angle. Do you have any questions about that? OK. All right. So in the same way that for Gauss's law, I thought of, OK, let's 
divide this up into wedges, and I'll surround the charge with any shape by following different spheres in different places, I can do the same thing over here for, for Ampere's law. So, and in, in both cases, I'll think about a boundary, right? So here, I was thinking about boundaries that were on spherical shells, and I'd stay on the spherical shell and then have an area that's um, uh, parallel to the electric field lines to drop back down to another spherical shell. Similarly here, let me think of walking along a circle, and then if I want to change my radius, I'll drop straight, I'll just hop straight down to the next circle, okay? In a way, and I'll hop down in a way that I'm not picking up any magnetic field lines as I do it. As I go toward or away from the wire, there's no contribution to the magnetic field that's parallel to my path. So contribution to, to integral b dot dl is zero along these lines. And then I'll walk along another circle. If I want to change my radius, I drop straight down to another uh, circle and then follow that radius. By doing that, I can build up a line integral okay, that's any shape I want. right? So it's the same kind of, of calculus concept. If I want to make any complicated shape I want, I just think of making this gradation of which sphere I'm on finer and finer and finer, and in the limit of very small um, changes of spheres, I can get any smooth path I like. But it's, this, it's, the same, it's the same concept that we used for the Gauss's law case. Okay, Gauss's law here, um, Ampere's law here. Do you have any questions about that generalization to the shape? Okay. All right. So it works for any smooth path. Also, it's not just that I need to think of this loop of wire. I need a loop of wire. It's not just that I need to think of this loop of wire as staying flat in the plane. I mean, what I've drawn up there on the board is flat, right? I started with a circle, and then I, I deformed things for you, and it all kind of stayed in the plane. But I could think of going out of the plane as well. That's not a problem, OK? It still works for Ampere's law. The, the reason it's still going to work is I can, again, think of um, walking, perpen you know, walking parallel to the wire direction. Anytime I walk parallel to the wire direction to get myself on another circle over here, if I walk parallel to the wire direction, there's no magnetic field parallel to my path. Integral b dot dl is, is 0 along that segment, OK? So I can deform it this way or that way. And I still get the same thing. And I can move it anywhere I like. right? I can move, um, move the loop I'm considering anywhere I like along the wire, right? twist it however I like. And it's clear what's the uh, current enclosed and what's not the current enclosed. Do you have any questions about Ampere's law? Yeah? So does it only work if you can the Ah, OK. So good question. Um, all right. So I did show you the specific case where the magnetic field, where we used for the magnetic field the BOS of our law, which assumed an infinitely long wire. Okay? So yeah, you're actually asking an excellent question. This law here, okay, which I demonstrated to you worked for the BOS of our case of an infinitely long wire, it also works for smaller wires. So, uh, so this, this line integral of b dot dl equals mu naught times the sum of the enclosed currents always works um, for exactly the magnetic field, right? So even if I'm in a non-infinite wire case, which is the case in the lab, right? You know, no infinite wires in the lab. So I have some w strange geometry, right? And I think of this circuit, you know, every piece of that wire is going to contribute something to the magnetic field over here. It all works. It's pretty, pretty impressive, all right? But it all works. So every little bit of the complicated geometry of the circuit contributes something to the magnetic field I measure. And yet, when I go around that line integral, somehow it knows, bam, this was the current going through it. Pretty cool. And then as I, you know, as I change the shape of the wire, it'll still work. Okay. So um, yes, so it works for any closed loop. And you care about the current that's enclosed. So you could have multiple wires inside, and they'll still work. You could have some wires inside and some wires outside. And I only count the wires that are inside. Okay? The reason the wires on the outside don't contribute is because if I think about, well, what kind of shape magnetic field is the wire on the outside making? If I think, well, all right, a wire on the outside of my loop, so my loop's here, and I have a wire over here giving me a magnetic field that just kind of comes straight through. It'll give me some positive contributions and some negative contributions. So it'll just end up canceling if the wire's not uh, going through the loop. Any questions? Other questions? Good question. All right. 
So we have built up a lot of what's called Maxwell's equations. So Maxwell's equations tell us everything we need to know about how electric fields and magnetic fields and charges and magnetism all work. And it's all contained in a set of four equations known as Maxwell's equations. I've got the caveat up here that it's incomplete right now. But here's what we've learned so far. We discussed today Gauss's law. Okay, Gauss's law for charges is that the flux enclosed in a closed surface area, electric flux enclosed in a closed surface area equals 1 over epsilon naught times the sum of the charges enclosed. The magnetic extension of that says that the magnetic flux through any closed surface is zero because no one's found a magnetic monopole, despite my friend Dr. Bob trying really hard. Then there are these other equations. We just got to this part, which is called Ampere's law. We saw that the line integral of the magnetic field around a closed, um, a cl a closed line path is mu naught times the sum of the charges enclosed. And we've also talked about how the line integral of the electric field around any closed path um, is zero in the steady state situation. Remember, we made that analogy between potential differences like height, and if I go around any closed loop, I better come back to the same height. So these equations all are correct in the steady state case. Steady state means the current that I've got is the same the whole time I'm measuring the system, so steady current, and it means the charges aren't moving around. Okay? If I go to the case where things are changing in time, some of these equations are going to get updated. And that's what we'll be doing in the next couple of chapters, is talking about the non-steady state situation, where I have fields that change with time. Okay, it could be magnetic field, could be electric field. In those cases, I'm going to have some updates to these equations. All right? So one of the updates is that we're going to update the line integral of the electric field around a closed path. If I have a changing magnetic field around, okay? So if I have a changing magnetic field around, we're going to get a new term there that's going to, well, update that physics, OK? And, it's, and how would I get a changing magnetic field? The one of the ways to get a changing magnetic field is to take a magnet and wave it around near your experiment. Changing magnetic field, OK? That's one way to do it. That'll update this equation. All right, that'll be in chapter 3. And in chapter 24, we'll see that we should add a term here as well in case we have a changing electric field, OK? How would I make an electric field that changes in time? Well, whatever circuit you're measuring, I'll take a point charge and, and wave it around near your circuit, and now there's a changing electric field acting on your circuit. And that'll be chapter 24. Once we have all that together, now it's the full story, okay? I'm just giving you a preview of what's coming in the next two chapters. Once we add in the time-dependent cases, we've covered everything, right? And then that'll be it. That'll be Maxwell's equations. Now, this might look like a lot of math to you, um, but this is remarkably simple, f only four equations. This is remarkably simple for something that describes so many different phenomena, for something that describes, for example, photons are in here. Okay? So the fact that, that light can just travel through space, okay, that's in there, light's in there. Um, these equations enable um, all, any kind of telecommunications you like, whether it's communications over a wire, or whether it's communications in the airwaves, okay? It enables radio, it enables your cell phones. If you've got any kind of electronics device with a chip in it, it's enabling all that. So the, just this small set of equations, right? Back on, can you imagine being uh, James Clerk Maxwell and figuring this stuff out, right? So, so Maxwell, um, Maxwell, you'll see this is called the Ampere-Maxwell law. Maxwell is the one who noticed that this term should be there. And once he did that, he was able to unify all this stuff and say, wow, because I've put all these things together, I can now explain light as well as magnetism, as well as electricity, et cetera, et cetera. Could he possibly have foreseen the impact on society of his four equations? I don't think anybody could have foreseen the impact, right? These four equations, because Maxwell figured that term out, it unified light with magnetism, with electricity, and it laid the foundation for global communications. So. Never say physics didn't do something for you. Gave you cell phones, right? And the internet and all that good stuff. So anyway, Maxwell's equations. The full story's coming up in chapters 23 and 24. And we're done for today.